Okay, uh, so I start the uh, lecture for today, which is on uh, one of uh, different kind of uh, topic related to time series in uh, finance, right? And it's 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 not typically what you would see for time series analysis, but uh, I'll draw some connection between that. So before I start, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Shashi Jain. I'm assistant professor in Department of Management Studies at uh, IASC. Uh, so uh, prior to uh, joining IASC, I was uh, uh, working at ING as a front office uh, analyst. Uh, the role there is something around where you want to find out what is the kind of a risk uh, the trading uh, activities in the bank uh, amount to, right? And how can you mitigate that kind of risk? And you, you need to quantify those numbers. So you can say that uh, you buying these stocks makes the uh, portfolio of the bank risky or less risky. But what you want to do more precisely is quantify what that amount of risk is. And that is required by regulators to set aside some amount of capital so that in case the uh, market is, doesn't go in the direction the bank expects it to go, uh, the wealth of the depositor, deposit holders or other people should not vanish, right? So, um, uh, 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 so th that's broadly a very uh, simplistic view of what uh, risk side of uh, uh, banking uh, uh, involves, but uh, that's that was the area where I was working in. Uh, I got into the field of finance uh, while uh, working uh, on my PhD thesis, which was on investment decisions related to uh, nuclear power plants. So you want to make an investment decision uh, such as, do I build a large nuclear reactor or do we build several small nuclear reactors, right? And uh, what you realize is that uh, such kind of uh, optionality cannot be measured by the traditional valuation techniques, which, uh, which is uh, simply you have some cash flows in the future and you discount them back, you aggregate that, uh, you compare the, uh, the value, net present value for two projects, and then you decide whether one is better than the other, right? But uh, it doesn't account for what is, uh, in, uh, you know, the optionality in it, uh, which is, uh, in one case, when you have a large nuclear reactor, you cannot uh, uh, say once you start the project, you have to finish the project, right? And if there are several small uh, nuclear reactors, uh, you start a project and you see how uh, things are evolving, right? So if the electricity prices are going higher and there is a, uh, you know, there is a movement towards less carbon emission related uh, 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 power generation uh, technology, then you go for the next reactor. Uh, but if uh, scenarios turn bad, for instance, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, movement against nuclear power, then you can sort of uh, abandon your project after the first reactor has been constructed, right? So this, uh, uh, there is a value in this decision that you can take in the future. And uh, you, the valuation of that uh, is connected to how financial options are priced, right? And that's where uh, I got into the topic of finance uh, or uh, uh, derivative pricing. And uh, today's lecture is more or less going to be in that direction where we talk about how, uh, what are options and how are, uh, what is the maths behind the option pricing, right? So uh, uh, I, I think uh, you, uh, everyone uh, went through the course of uh, Professor Rangarajan where he talked about time series analysis and also I guess uh, you would have touched upon Gauch model, right? Uh, so uh, uh, in Gauch model, you predict the volatility of the stock uh, given the observations in the past, right? So. Uh, you have some um, view of what the volatility of uh, the stock prices are, and then you say what's going to be the volatility in the future time period. Uh, so one of the uses of this uh, volatility uh, forecast is uh, in option pricing. And uh, we'll see that uh, it's not precisely correct what I'm saying, but uh, to start with, we'll see that uh, this volatility somewhere comes into the picture uh, when, when you have to deal with derivatives. Uh, uh, which uh, which price the volatility, right? So till now you saw that there is volatility in stock price, and now you want to price the volatility, right? And you want to buy and sell this volatility. 
And in order to do that, you have these contracts which are known as options. And uh, uh, what are they? So they look something like this. So if you go to NSC, you can buy or sell options on, uh, say, this is SBIN, which is State Bank of India or Reliance, right? Uh, they have associated with them an expiry date, right? So uh, these options are contracts which are valid up till certain point of time, right? So in this case, it is valid up till 30th May 2019. Uh, they have a type which is a call option and uh, or a put option. So C is for call and P is for put. And the E here is for the type of the option. So you, you have different variants of an option. Uh, some are uh, options which can be exercised only at the expiry, and the, those are called as the European option. And uh, there are some options which can be uh, exercised any point before the expiry, right? So those are known as American options. So I think uh, in the uh, in NSE, the options that are traded are uh, by default European options. Uh, the next thing is the strike price. Uh, so this is the price that you agree uh, in case of call option to buy the stock and in case of put option to sell the stock, right? Uh, so for simplicity, I'll just take call option right now. So uh, what together this specifies what your option is, right? So what is the underlying stock? Uh, what is the expiry date? What is the, whether you're buying the stock or selling the uh, stocks? So it's call or put. Uh, and what is the strike price? So what this says is that uh, on 30th May 2019, if the uh, stock price is uh, greater than 360, I will buy it from whoever has sold me the option, uh, the stock at 360, right? So even if it is 500, uh, I'll get the stock at 360, right? And what happens if the stock price is below 360? So if the stock price on 30th May 2019 is at, uh, say, 100 rupees, uh, what would the option holder do? Yeah, so that's where you see the optionality coming into picture. So he, he has the option to exercise it, which means that he also has the option not to exercise it, right? So he doesn't have to buy the uh, stock if it is below uh, the strike price, right? So that's where the optionality comes into picture. Uh, so th this together, uh, this whole thing defines the option that, that is being traded, right? So this is a contract, right? Uh, and uh, you can buy and sell this contract. So this contract itself will have a value, and those you can see here, right? So these, like the stock prices, the value of this contract will also be changing every day. So on uh, for, for this particular option, it opened at the price of 3 rupees, uh, it reached a maximum of 3.30, and it uh, at the lowest price was 0.3, and it uh, uh, you know the last or the closing price was this. So the price of this option is also uh, fluctuating, right? So this contract itself can be bought and sold. Uh, so you bought an option contract, and then you say that okay, I don't want to hold this option contract. You can sell the contract itself uh, uh, before the expiry of the contract, right? And what we are interested in is uh, what should this uh, value of this contract, right? So what are these prices? Right? Uh, now, uh, an obvious thing is that uh, this, is, uh, this contract is being traded in an exchange, right? So you observe a price, right? So you know the price that is there, and that's the price at which you can buy and sell it. So why do you need to price an option? Can someone? Uh, Take a guess, why would you like to price an option? So if you want to buy an option, uh, uh, you know, at the, say, at the end of the day, if you were going to buy the option, at what price would you buy the SBIN option? No, it would be at this particular price. So it was, uh, at, towards the end of the day, it was selling at 0.40. So if you want to buy that option, you need to find someone who is willing to sell the option, and that person is willing to sell it at 0.4, right? So you, you, you will get this option at 0.4. So as such, you do not really need, uh, uh, say, a sophisticated pricing formula for uh, uh, options. They are just prices available, and you, if you are willing to buy it at that price, you buy it, right? So like uh, 
you go to a shop and you want to buy a toothpaste, you see the price that is available. If you have, if you are willing for pay, to pay that, uh, you can buy it, right? So uh, options also behave somewhere similarly, uh, except these uh, prices are somewhere linked to the stock price, right? So the uh, underlying stock price of uh, uh, the state bank was at that point 348, right? And this price uh, would fluctuate over a period of time. Uh, and also, as you get closer to maturity, the price of the option starts reducing. Right? So uh, why is that? Because, uh, OK, just, just to wrap up what, what I just uh, uh, spoke here was, uh, the definition of option is it gives the holder or the person who has bought the option the right but not the obligation. So you can buy if it is profitable, and you don't have to do anything if it is not profitable. Uh, so if you buy, if it's an option to buy, it's called a call option. And if it's an option to sell, it's called a put option. Uh, the underlying, which in our previous example was the stock of uh, State Bank of India at a pre-agreed price, which is known as the strike price. Right. Uh, typically, uh, some of the standard options are traded in the uh, stock exchange. Right. So, uh, as you buy a stock, in the same way, you can buy the stock option. The price of the option would depend upon the maturity. So, how far uh, from today is the option going to mature? Right. Uh, the type of the option. Uh, what is the current price of the underlying? So, what is the stock value of State Bank of India right now? Depending upon that together with what is the strike price that you are agreeing, uh, uh, what you agree on, uh, would define the uh, price of the option. So one of the other ingredient that comes into picture is the volatility of the underlying, right? So if, a, uh, if an underlying stock is highly volatile, right, so its price can go from 100 to 500 within a day, uh, and a stock price whose uh, uh, value is like very certain, right, so it stays between uh, within a day, it always fluctuates only between 110 or 100, right? So you more or less know where the stock price is going to end up in one case, and in the other case, you do not know, right? So in one case, the option will be a lot more expensive than in the other case. Right? So we want to find this precise relation uh, of how the stock, uh, what is the relationship between the uh, uncertainty in the stock price and an option. Right? So that's what this uh, whole uh, uh, lecture is about. And then we go into uh, the uh, development of the maths that is required to deal with the uh, pricing of options. Uh, at the expiry, the option, uh, at the expiry, you r really know what the value of the option is, right? So, uh, uh, there is no uncertainty in the price of the option. Uh, it's equal to uh, this, uh, whatever this payoff looks like. This is for a, a call option, and this is for a put option, right? So if the stock price on 30th May is uh, uh, somewhere here, you, you make a profit equal to this thing, because you will buy the stock at uh, strike K, while the stock price was this. So you buy it and immediately sell it and realize your profit, right? So uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is at the expiry. But at any point prior to the expiry, uh, in order to um, ascertain the value of the option, uh, you need to do some uh, calculations, right? And what you have to do for that is what we'll look at later. Right? Then the other question that we deal with is, uh, um, Suppose there are two uh, cash flows that are going to happen in future, right? So there's one cash flow uh, where, uh, say, the government of India tells you that I'm going to give you 100 rupees uh, at the end of one year. And there's another one where, uh, say, a uh, company which is, uh, say, Jet Airways, for example, says that you, they, they are going to give you 100 rupees at the end of one year. Will the value of that hundred? Uh, will the value of uh, these two contracts be similar? Which one will be more valuable? What? 
Yeah. So, uh, and uh, what, what makes one more valuable than the other? What? Ah, yeah, but what is that? Uh, risk. risk, right? So one is more risky than the other, right? So at some point, there is a, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's assume that there is one mode of cash flow which is, uh, which is completely certain, right? So there is no risk involved with it, and that's called risk-free. And a future cash flow uh, uh, which is risk-free, which is, you know, is going to happen, is discounted using a risk-free rate, right? Uh, but if uh, there is some uncertainty in uh, the future cash flow, you do not discount it with a risk-free rate, but with a rate higher than the risk-free rate, right? So uh, when a bank gives you uh, a loan, they are not charging you the, they are not, you're, you're not paying the uh, rate you get when you uh, put money in fixed deposit, right? And the reason is, uh, uh, you are more riskier than, uh, um, it's more risky for the bank to give money to you than it is for you to put money in the fixed deposit, right? Because fixed deposit, you are more likely to get the money, and in the other case, you might not, the bank might not receive the money the, they have loaned out to you, right? So, uh, so when things are certain, you use risk-free rate. So what we want to see is, uh, in the case of options, uh, when can you use the risk-free rate? Right. So options we see is completely uncertain. Right. So you uh, you have a stock which can end up anywhere in this uh, in this place. Right. So your profit could be uh, vary from being at zero or anywhere here. Uh, depending upon where the stock price lands on 30th May 2019, right? Uh, so uh, it's an uncertain thing. But what we are going to see is that you can still use a risk-free rate uh, when you price an option. And we will see why uh, that is possible. And uh, that's, uh, that's what is known as the Black-Scholes uh, uh, model, and for which they got the Nobel in economics, right? So that's the underlying framework which has been used uh, uh, for, uh, for many of these uh, option pricing theory that we deal with. Although people have moved on from that, they have seen there are drawbacks to the model, but uh, some of the elements that were used there are still the foundation. Right, so, uh, so now we go move on to developing the mathematics that is required for uh, pricing of option, and we start with a uh, with a Brownian motion. So uh, Brownian motion came about when Robert Brown uh, noticed the pollen grains were uh, moving randomly in water, right? And uh, that was later on explained by Einstein, I think, uh, and. Uh, one of the first persons to use uh, uh, Brownian motion in the field of finance was Bachelier, and he used it in around around the same time as uh, Einstein explained his uh, theory on random motions. Uh, and uh, his PhD thesis, as such, was lost in you know no one uh, knew about it for quite some time, uh, till uh, Samuelson. Uh, he, he's a famous economist. He he brought it back and he saw that uh, uh, you know they, he had derived the whole option pricing formula and so on in his uh, thesis uh, uh, which which at that point was not so relevant but uh, going forward it became more and more relevant right so the work which uh, was done by black shows was more or less done uh, say 50 years before that by uh, bachelier and also one of the Interesting thing is, right now, again, Bachelier's formula sort of came into picture because uh, uh, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but uh, so uh, Black Scholes model, one of the uh, benefits of the model is that the way they model the stock price, the stock price never becomes negative, right? And that's what you would uh, observe, that stock price are always uh, uh, greater than zero. And if it's zero, that means that the company has defaulted and is gone. Uh, uh, and Bachelier's formula didn't have that feature in it, right? So it could have, uh, you could have negative values or positive values. So, uh, so yeah, obviously Black-Scholes formula was like more uh, uh, useful. Uh, 
but recently interest rates uh, became negative, right? So in many countries right now, the interest rates are negative and there are options on interest rates, right? So and if you want to model options on interest rates, now suddenly you start using the bachelor's formula compared to the Black-Scholes model. But uh, yeah, that's uh, not relevant for our topic as such. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, in, in this uh, small bit uh, of the lecture, we will uh, cover how uh, Brownian motion is constructed and what are the properties of Brownian motion. Uh, we then go to uh, a very, uh, you know, very basic understanding of stochastic calculus, which is required for us to derive the Black-Scholes formula, right? And uh, then we go and derive the Black-Scholes formula and sort of uh, uh, build our intuition around what that formula is and what is happening, right? So that, that is the uh, essence of the whole uh, lecture that I'm going to give today. So to start with, we start with uh, building up of uh, Brownian motion and uh, uh, some of the properties of Brownian motion. And we also sort of uh, look at what is known as quadratic variation, which is uh, something which uh, uh, sets apart stochastic calculus with normal calculus. Yeah, so uh, in order to, you know, uh, arrive till Brownian motion, we start with uh, what is known as symmetric random walk. So it's a quite simple process. Uh, uh, at each uh, time point, this uh, one, two, three, four, five, you will toss a, uh, toss a coin. And depending upon the outcome, uh, if it is head, the uh, xj will take a value of one, else it will take a minus one value, right? And then you define uh, a process M, which is just the summation of all these XJs, right? So at uh, you start with uh, zero, right? So in, if the first one was a head, then M1 becomes uh, one. If uh, the next one was tail, then it is equal to one plus minus one, so it becomes zero. And uh, another tail, so minus uh, one and so on, right? So this is a, a symmetric random walk. Yeah, so from symmetric random walk, uh, we want to see some of the properties of the symmetric random walk. And uh, we, we are slowly going to convert the symmetric random walk to a Brownian motion. So uh, some of the properties of the symmetric random walk are uh, the increments, uh, non-overlapping increments of this process M are uh, independent, right? Uh, why would they be independent? Because uh, underlying uh, uh, coin tosses are independent, right? So uh, th this is a combination of some coin tosses and uh, similarly this one, and they are all independent. So each of these uh, 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 differences would be independent of each other. Uh, the expected value of each increment, what would be the expected value of say uh, MK2 minus MK1? Zero because it's a, it's a summation of xj and expectation of xj is equal to uh, so expectation of uh, sum of xj is equal to the sum of expectation of xj and each of them is equal to zero so uh, it's going to be zero and uh, what is the variance of the increment so for for example for this one what would be the variance of the uh, mki plus 1 minus mki. So it would be the variance of summation of xj, right? And we know that uh, xj are independent, right? So it's, uh, and with a mean zero, so it's basically the variance or expectation of uh, xj square, right? And that is equal to uh, uh, Expectation of xj square is one, so summation of xj square, so it will be equal to the number of uh, uh, terms, yes, right? So ki plus, uh, yeah, ki plus one minus ki. Right, so this part is uh, clear to everyone? Okay, so the other property of this uh, uh, symmetric random walk is that uh, the process is going to be a martingale, right? Uh, what is a martingale? A martingale is uh, uh, given information right now, what is the expected value of the process in the future, right? Uh, 
So for example, uh, given uh, the stock price of uh, State Bank of India today, what is, what is uh, in expectation the stock price of State Bank of India uh, on uh, say the next day, right? So uh, if, if we assume that there is uh, the uh, uh, interest rates are zero, this expectation would be equal, right? So, so and so the expectation of stock price of uh, uh, some uh, say State Bank of India in our example. Uh, Given the stock price of State Bank of India today, right, is let's say it's 100. If it is equal to 100, then this process is uh, martingale, right? If it is uh, for sure greater than 100, then it's a sub martingale, and if it is uh, less than 100, then it is a super martingale. So, uh, So what we uh, uh, want to show is that the uh, symmetric random walk is a martingale. So what you do is uh, uh, you just add subtract, sorry, you just add subtract MK, right? And then using the linearity of the expectation operator, you say that this is equal to the conditional expectation of this plus conditional expectation of MK. This one will be equal to MK because you already have the information at uh, time TK. And this one is going to be uh, expectation of ML minus uh, MK, right? Uh, why is that? Because uh, this increment is in, uh, independent of FK, right? That's what we saw in the properties of uh, uh, this M. Uh, so if it is independent, so you can just take, uh, you don't need to use this conditional operator, and you just look at the expectation of ML minus MK, and we, we saw was equal to zero. So this is equal to MK, right? So you see that uh, uh, the future value of M, uh, given the information time TK, where K is less than L, is equal to whatever is the uh, value at that point of time, right? So whatever was the observed value of M at uh, TK would be equal to the exp any uh, its future expected value, right? Uh, and the uh, uh, next property which will be uh, useful in all our, uh, uh, you know, uh, slides going forward is uh, what is known as a quadratic vari variation. And it's basically just uh, the sum of the squares of each of the individual increment, right? So you, uh, if you look at this uh, plot, so you take each of these increments, right? Uh, and you square them up and you add them up, right? So that is what is known, uh, what is the quadratic variation. And this quadratic variation is equal to uh, K, right? So because uh, each one of them is uh, basically a summation of uh, x, right, which takes a value of 1 or minus 1. So the square of that will be 1. And so if you sum up uh, a series of 1 from j is equal to 1 to k, and so it will be equal to k. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between uh, quadratic variance and uh, the variance? Right, so uh, what is the variance of a a random number? Yeah, so by definition, it is equal to expectation of x minus x bar squared, right? Uh, but what we are talking here about is a qu a quadratic variation. So let me give you the pictorial representation of this, right? So when you are calculating the quadratic variation, you just look at a particular realization of this path, right? So this path was constructed through a series of uh, uh, coin tosses, right? Uh, uh, so say it was H, H, T, T, H, T, right? So which resulted in this path. There could have been another series of uh, coin tosses which would have resulted in another path, right? So it would have resulted in something like this and so on. So you could have as many uh, these series and you would have different realization. Now you want to find the variation of this M at this particular time point, right? 
So what would you do? You would take, uh, you see all the realizations of M. Uh, you take the mean of that and you compute this expectation, right? So variance is uh, when you look at across all the paths. When you're look, talking about quadratic variation, it is just along a path. So you're taking the path here, you're taking the square of the sums of each of these uh, intervals and you add it up. So the quadratic variation that you get for this path is uh, with respect to this path, right? So this quadratic variation itself is a random variable, right? So it would depend upon omega, uh, the series of uh, uh, coins that were tossed here, right? So this is, uh, what is the qu quadratic variance? Right, so uh, with this, uh, we move on to, uh, you know, a more, uh, 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 from scale symmetric, uh, no, from the symmetric random walk, we move on to scale symmetric random walk. So what uh, scale symmetric random walk does is it, uh, uh, sort of speedens up the process of these uh, coin tosses that we were doing. So that uh, now between uh, zero to five, you have, uh, no, between, in every second, you have around, uh, uh, say, n tosses, right? So this uh, subscript n here is for the number of coin tosses that are going to happen between zero and one, right? So in each interval, how many coin tosses are going to happen? And uh, uh, earlier we were moving the m process m by one and minus one. Uh, in this case, we are going to scale it down. So instead of moving uh, by one and minus one, you are going to move it by one by square root of n and minus one by square root of n, right? So for example, if n is equal to 100, that means that there are going to be 100 uh, coin tosses between zero to one. And with each uh, uh, toss, you would uh, either the, uh, uh, this W will go up or down with a value of 0.1, right? So 1 over square root of 100, which is 0.1. Uh, so this, this, uh, if you do that, this picture would then transform into something like that, right? So you are now having a lot more uh, uh, movements. Uh, and each of the increments do not add up too much, but over uh, zero to one, the uh, you know the added value is more or less similar, right? So this is a, a scaled symmetric random walk. And why we are doing this is what we are going to do next is we are going to uh, take the limiting case of n going to infinity, right? So that is going to uh, move us from a discrete form to a continuous. Uh, process, right? So right now, M N T is a discrete process because it takes value only at uh, uh, discrete time points, right? And here also it is at discrete time points, except now there are more points between uh, zero to one. And uh, once we move this N to infinity, we'll have a, say, approximation for a continuous process. And that process will be known as the Brownian motion, right? So, uh, we, we want to again look at the properties of this scale symmetric uh, random walk, and they, they are pre pretty much uh, along the same line as symmetric random walk. So the increments of this scale symmetric random walk, uh, where there are uh, n number of tosses per unit of uh, time, uh, so the increments between non-overlapping time intervals are independent, right, because they are from independent coin tosses. Uh, the expectation of the increment is equal to zero, right? That's easy to see. And the variance of uh, the increment is equal to T minus S, right? So uh, it, it's again, uh, let me just write why that would be the case. So. Knowing that the uh, this uh, cross terms will be zero because they are independent, you, you'll have this one will be equal to n t by n, 
right? Which we saw in the previous example, the variance of a symmetric random walk. And this one will be ns by n, right? So it will come out to be t minus s. And the, uh, right, so the variance is equal to t minus s. Uh, and uh, uh, it's again a martingale, right? So given information at time s, which is less than time t, the expected value of uh, the ran, uh, this uh, random walk at time t would be equal to whatever is the whatever is the realized value of uh, uh, the random walk at time s. Yeah. <coughs> Similarly, the quadratic various, uh, variation, which is represented like this, uh, uh, w which is the sum of the square of the increments, will be equal to t. Right, it's a, uh, again because it's a summation of xj process and which takes a value one minus one. Uh, it's, it's straightforward to see this. Yeah. So uh, the thing that is important right now is uh, we want to see what is this limiting distribution of the scale symmetric random walk. Right. So uh, in order to do that, uh, let's see what would be the uh, probability that. Uh, at time t equals to 0.25, the value of this uh, scale symmetric random walk, where there are 100 uh, coin tosses, uh, uh, be equal to 0.1. How would you compute that? So how many uh, uh, tosses would happen in this uh, at 0.25, from 0 to 0.25? 25, right? And uh, the sum of uh, this 25 uh, uh, tosses uh, with an increment of 0.1 should be equal to 0.1, right? So when will that happen? Right, so with uh, each uh, coin toss, uh, your uh, x value goes up or down with 0.1, right? Uh, and in the end, you leave, uh, you are, uh, you, uh, the value sum is equal to 0.1. So that is only if there are 13 uh, heads and 12 tails, right? Right. So uh, and and then you will see that it's equal to 13 c2 when over 2 raised to the power 25. Right. So that would be the probability of this. So. Uh, what you can see is that uh, with uh, uh, you, you can get the distribution probability distribution of this uh, uh, at 0.25 at this point of time uh, through the binomial distribution, right? Because it's constructed through this Bernoulli's uh, uh, this binomial distribution because you have sequence of uh, coin uh, tosses, and that's why it will be a, a binomial distribution. And uh, the limiting case of this binomial distribution would be uh, a normal distribution, right? So you can use the central limit theorem to arrive at that conclusion. Uh, what would be the mean of that distribution? So of uh, W100T, uh, the expected value of that would be equal to zero. And what would be the variance of that? Variance of W hundred T. This is something which we derived here, right? So you start with uh, put it as uh, T equals to zero, which is equal to zero. So variance of W n minus zero is equal to T minus zero. So it will be equal to T, right? So variance of W n T is equal to T. So you. Uh, you now know what the uh, distribution of uh, uh, in the limiting case would be. It would be a normal distribution with mean zero and variance of uh, equal to t, right? So, and that those are the only two things you need to uh, define a normal distribution, right? So, So uh, in uh, so basically, you have uh, say uh, you want to find the process W at any point of time t, right? So what you do is you uh, initially had uh, t t minus one, t minus two, and so on, right? 
and this was one. Uh, now, you, what you want to do is uh, you want to discretize it even more. So you start dividing this into, say, two times. And then you start dividing this again, and so on. So uh, at some point, uh, th so this gives, uh, this 100 gives the number of times you are dividing this uh, interval one. Yeah? So, uh, and when this n goes to infinity, uh, uh, we, we arrive at a Brownian motion, right? So until that, it's a discrete process. And then from discrete, you jump to a continuous process, right? And then we use all the properties of the continuous time process. Yeah, so the, the discrete case was a binomial, right? And then the distribution would be a binomial distribution, right? So if you plot the distribution, you will get a, uh, uh, you know, probability at each of these points because the value will take only these, it can only take these values, right? Uh, and if you keep increasing the uh, number of increments, it starts approaching a normal distribution, right? And the mean of that normal distribution would be zero and the standard deviation of that normal distribution would be square root of t. Yeah, uh, this is also the proof of, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's you don't have to go through this, but uh, I'll just say what, what uh, the way it's approach is, uh, uh, you know the moment generating function of a normal uh, distribution, it is equal to uh, this. And similarly, you find the moment generating function of this binomial distribution, and then you uh, equate the two in the limiting case, right? So if in the limiting case, uh, 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 this, this approaches the moment generating function of a normal distribution, then you say that the two distribution would be the same, right? And that's how you prove this. So I'm not going through the proof. It's, uh, uh, you know, if you want, you can look at it later. Right, so uh, with this, we arrive at uh, uh, the definition of a Brownian motion. Uh, it's defined on, uh, you know, a proper probability space. Uh, and for every uh, element of this uh, space, you would have uh, 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 a process uh, omega t, which depends upon this, this small omega, so uh, wt, which depends upon omega, uh, with w0 is equal to 0. And uh, uh, at any point, uh, uh, w, for, you know, for, uh, for non-overlapping intervals, uh, wt1 minus wt0, wt2 minus wt1 are all independent, right? And uh, the expectation of uh, this uh, wti plus 1 minus wti is equal to 0. And the variance of uh, this process is equal to uh, ti plus 1 minus ti. So whatever is the length of the increment, right? So uh, uh, in, in a sense, what it's saying is that uh, you have a random process, right? Uh, at, if you take a time cross-section here, uh, it will have a mean equal to 0. And the variance of that would depend upon the time point here, right? So it will be uh, uh, sigma w at t will be equal to square root of t. Yeah, uh, and, and this distribution is normal, so it doesn't have a, a higher non-central moments, right? This is stationary, right? Because uh, uh, you know uh, what the sigmas are. So you, you should be able to define the distribution uh, at each point of time, right? So that's, that's the... Yeah, so uh, next topic that we uh, deal with is uh, uh, when we have a function of WT, right? So what do we do with that? Uh, I don't know, uh, when is the break for you guys? Okay, okay, so we take a break now and so the break is until 11.30, yeah? No, the break is at 11.30. Okay, okay, so it's at, uh, okay, 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 so I have some time. Uh, no, 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 so I can take the break, uh, at, so we go through a bit more slides and then we can take a break.
Yeah, so uh, uh, what you realize is that uh, the uh, option pricing is more or less, uh, uh, you know, working with functions of Brownian motion, right? So why is that? Is because uh, you know that the option that we had, you know, what was the underlying uh, in it was a stock price process, right? And we are going to see that we can model this stock price process uh, using some geometric Brownian uh, motion, which depends upon uh, you know the Brownian motion. So basically, it is uh, uh, if you write it, it's somewhere a function of WT, right? And what we want to do uh, now look at is uh, how can you deal with the functions of WT, right? So why is it not trivial to deal with the function of WT is uh, if you had, say, a function of g of t, right? And you want to find the derivative of this, what would you do? You would have, a, uh, at some point, you will have g dash t dt, right? Uh, the problem with w is you cannot do this, right? Uh, the reason is because w is, uh, if, if you take a very small interval, Right, and you zoom it in, uh, you could land up here or here or here, right? Now, if you zoom it in further, you will again have a very different uh, uh, point at which you will end up, and that's why it's very, uh, it's not possible, you, you cannot define this the delta w t divided by delta t in limiting case, right? So this, because this part is uh, uh, random, so this, this derivative will be, uh, you know, not well defined. So that's why you need to do something more uh, 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 different than uh, usual calculus, right? So that's why we need this whole stochastic calculus here. And uh, in order to uh, uh, motivate why we need something different, we start with what is known as the uh, uh, first order variation, right? So. Uh, uh, yeah, so we'll go to quadratic variation, but before going to quadratic variation, we want to look at what is known as the first order variation. So first order variation gives you the amounts of up and down movement of a function between zero and t, right? So in this case, uh, 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 the, the only thing is that you add the down, uh, uh, so you add the up movements and you subtract the down movement. So you basically you want to see how much it moved from, uh, you know, in absolute sense. So from here to here, you add it up, and from this point to this point, you'll subtract it, and from here to here, again, you will add it up, right? So the first order variation is equal to ft1 minus f0. Uh, in this case, you will take uh, minus of ft2 minus ft1, right? Because you want to just see the absolute uh, change here. And uh, finally, ft minus ft2, right? And uh, this can be written as uh, f dash t dt in each of these sub intervals, right? Uh, so uh, more, more uh, formally, the way we would arrive at this is uh, you, uh, uh, you partition this, uh, this space into smaller time intervals, right? Uh, with the, uh, uh, which is pi, and let this define the largest of these, uh, uh, intervals, right? So, in the limiting case, when the largest uh, increment of uh, tj plus 1 minus tj goes to 0, so everything else is going to 0, uh, we want to find the summation of absolute of uh, ftj plus 1 minus ftj, right? So, basically, this is just defining this in more regress way. Uh, and we want to find what the value would be. So this uh, this we can obtain using the mean value theorem, right? So mean value theorem says that uh, if this function is continuous and differentiable between ft1 and f, uh, uh, ftj and ftj plus one, you'll find a point uh, where the slope will match uh, the difference between these two, right? So ftj plus one minus ftj by this, so this, this uh, li slope of this line would be equal to f star tj, right? So you can write uh, uh, absolute value of this is equal to absolute value of f star tj times tj minus dk plus one minus tj. And the, in the limiting case of this thing, this would be the Riemann's integral and you will get 
this expression, right? Uh, now, what happens if we take uh, the quadratic variation? So, uh, is this uh, clear? Uh, just repeating some of the things that you already knew. So, uh, the quadratic variation is uh, somewhere similar to the first order variation, except now uh, you're taking the square of these uh, increments, right? So, in the last case, you had taken the absolute value of the increment, and in this case, we take the square of these increments. And we want to find the, uh, uh, some of these squared increments uh, when the largest interval goes to zero, right? That, that's the definition of the quadratic variation. So if you do it for a normal continuous function, what you will see is that uh, you again use the mean value theorem. So this, this value is equal to f star tj times uh, tj plus 1 minus tj, and then you take the square of that, so you get this expression. Uh, this will be less than or equal to, uh, uh, so you write tj plus 1 minus tj square as uh, the largest interval times tj plus 1 minus tj, right? And you can take this out as common, right? So, and this would be less than this because this is larger than any of the other increments, right? So, uh, so you end up with this uh, expression, and in the limiting case, this one will be equal to the Riemann integral, and this will go to zero. So this is basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, zero times whatever is the value, right? And should be equal to zero. So the quadratic variation of a normal function is equal to zero, right? Uh, Any doubt here? So, uh, so that is for a normal function. Now we look at a Brownian motion. So in the case of Brownian motion, uh, you will define the quadratic variation as uh, uh, from zero to n minus one, you take the uh, difference between the Brownian motion realization, right? So you're going along a particular realization of Brownian motion. So you're taking one of these paths and you are uh, uh, attaining the value of uh, Q, right? Uh, uh, is Q random? Q should be a random variable because it's uh, constructed using this uh, sum of uh, uh, normally distributed random variables, right? So it's a random variable. What we are going to see is that uh, in, in uh, this random variable will converge to a particular value, which is t, as the size of this interval goes to zero, right? So the expectation of q is going to go to some value, while the variance of uh, q is going to converge to zero, right? So uh, what does that mean? So if you have a variance equal to zero, what would that uh, imply? It's a, there is no uncertainty, so the randomness sort of disappears, right? So uh, in the limiting case, uh, the quadratic variation of uh, this, uh, 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 defined this way, will have an expectation and will have a variance which is equal to zero, right? So it will just be equal to a certain particular value. So this was a definition of the uh, Brownian motion where the increments were uh, independent and the expectation of this was equal to zero and the variance was equal to uh, uh, the difference in the time interval on which you are looking at, right? So Ts, then it will be T minus S, right? So with that, we go uh, and find out what would be the quadratic variation, right? So what we want to see is uh, we first want to find the expectation of Q. So that would be expectation of this summation, right? And because it's summation, you can bring expectation inside, right? And it is expectation of uh, these, uh, summation of expectation of these increments. So when we first look at uh, the expectation of one of the increments, right? So it would be expectation of WTJ plus one minus WTJ, the whole square. And that is nothing but the variance plus the expectation. Uh, expectation is zero, so it's equal to, so variance of WTJ plus one minus WTJ plus expectation of WTJ plus one minus WTJ, the whole square, which is equal to zero square. 
So it's basically the variance of uh, this thing, and it's equal to this delta t, right? Uh, so uh, one of the things we found out was uh, uh, this is for uh, uh, one of the increments. Q was the sum of all these increments, right? So it would be the summation of uh, uh, this tj plus 1 minus tj, and this will go to be, uh, it will come out to be t, right? So the expected value of the quadratic variation is equal to t, right? Uh, the next thing we want to see is what is the variance of this Q in the limiting case? So uh, the variance of uh, this thing is uh, nothing but uh, the expectation of the, uh, uh, the random variable x minus x bar, right? So the x bar we got from the previous uh, uh, case and the whole square of that, right? So when you uh, work with this expression, you get uh, raised to the power 4 and this part. Uh, this we already know is equal to tj plus 1 minus tj. So it will be equal to minus 2 tj plus 1 minus tj whole square. This one we know. And the thing that we don't know right now is this thing. But this is nothing because this is uh, 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 normal variable with uh, uh, variance tj plus 1 and this is tj. So this is basically a normal variable. Uh, and the expected value of the fourth moment of a normal variable is nothing but the uh, three times the squared of its variance, right? So this one will be equal to this. So basically what you get is that the variance of this process is equal to two times uh, a square of this increment, right? So two times delta t square, right? Uh, so what would be the variance of the uh, uh, process Q? It's summation of this thing, right? And then we will again use our uh, trick where we'll say that this is going to be less than or equal to 2 times uh, this delta t times the largest uh, interval. So yeah, this thing. And uh, this will be 2 times this t. And in the limiting case, this is going to be equal to 0, right? So. Uh, as the increments become smaller and smaller, uh, the quadratic variation, uh, uh, which is defined for the limiting case, uh, will in expectation have a value equal to t and will have a variance equal to t, right? So you can as such say that uh, q is equal to t, right? But uh, not strictly, but this is a more precise definition. Right, so uh, what, what it's saying is that the expectation of delta w times delta w, right, that's what the quadratic variation was defined as, is equal to delta t. Or what you see here is, d, you know, you can write it as dwt times dwt is equal to dt, right? So this is, uh, this is uh, a very important uh, thing in this whole uh, bit of our lecture where uh, uh, typically, when you have dt times dt, uh, right, what do you do? You say that uh, two small increments, if you uh, multiply them, it's very small and you can neglect it and it's equal to zero, right? But in this case, when dwt, dwt uh, terms are there, uh, you instead replace it with dt term, right? So this is going to be the thing that is uh, going to make the uh, the differential equation uh, when W is involved significantly different than a simple differential equation. Yeah. So, so the whole exercise that we did so far has resulted in this thing: dWt dWt is equal to dt. Uh, it's ideally it is expectation of this is equal to dt. But because the variance is also equal to zero, so we can say dwt dwt is equal to dt, and uh, that's what we are going to use uh, going forward, right? So uh, before we go on to the next topic, we, I think we should take a small break, and then we can uh, look at Ito's integral, right? So uh, so far, what we have looked at is we started with a. Uh, symmetric random walk, which was a discrete thing. Then we moved to, uh, you know, finer version of that, uh, uh, which was called the scale symmetric uh, uh, random walk. And the limiting case of that was known as the Brownian motion, right? So the Brownian motion was uh, uh, defined. And now we are interested in uh, the 
calculus that involves uh, Brownian motion, right? And one of the things that we find is that uh, typically the term dx dx is not present in usual calculus, but uh, when it comes to uh, stochastic calculus, this uh, dwt dwt terms cannot be ignored, and you need to insert use. So wherever they come, you have to uh, use insert this dt term, right? And then we see how it is going to be used in, uh, say, the Ito's integral. And uh, this, this would give us enough uh, a thing required to work with our uh, uh, derivation of Black-Scholes equation. Yeah? So uh, we can take a break of uh, 10 minutes, and then we can resume, I think. OK, so the, uh, uh, now we go on with uh, what is known as the Ito's integral. And uh, what it does is it, uh, uh, we want to say, if it was a normal, uh, you know, instead of dw, which was the Brownian motion, if we had a simpler uh, function g, and you wanted to integrate this process, uh, it, you would have simply done delta t times g dash t dt, right? Uh, but uh, because this wt is not differentiable with respect to time, you cannot do that here, right? So how do you uh, integrate such a process? Uh, for that, you would need to use what is known as the Intos integral. So uh, we start with something which is known as a simple process. and. Uh, uh, so we want to integrate uh, this uh, delta t dwt, and uh, we start defining it uh, as this. So uh, this delta t in, in this uh, simple example is again a random process, uh, except it remains constant between time intervals, right? So it will have some value here, and it will stay the same till this point, and then it will take another value, and it will stay same during the other period, right? So if uh, if you want to find i t where t is less than t1, then it will just be equal to delta t0 times w t minus w t0, right? So, and w t0 is equal to 0, so it will be delta 0 w t, right? Uh, if it was uh, somewhere here, if you want to find i t at this point of time, then it will be delta 0 times uh, t, w t1 and uh, delta t1 times whatever this in, uh, w for that in, interval is, right? So wt minus wt1, and so on, right? So uh, this is how you define this IT process. And the Ito's integral process is then the summation of uh, this thing with the uh, uh, with this increments becoming smaller and smaller, right? So and in the limiting case, it would be written as this uh, delta u dwu, right? So uh, Basically, this delta is again going to come in the derivation of Black-Scholes uh, model. So, uh, uh, an intuitive, uh, you know, reasoning of why we are having a delta process like this is uh, you are going to have different uh, stock position, right? So, the number of stocks that you are going to hold, uh, let's that would be defined by delta, right? So, and you know that you cannot instantly change your uh, holding in the stock, so. You, you, you buy the stock here, and you hold it till here, and then you say that you want to buy certain other unit of stock. So at the end of the day, you will have another unit of stock that you will hold for the next period of time, right? So this is a delta process, and uh, then DWT. Uh, although, uh, you know, uh, you can have any other process here. Uh, I'm just taking this delta process for simplicity, right? Uh, Delta t would be say say you, uh, at any point t it will be equal to this, so you don't know what the random process behind that is, but let's say we are observing this, right? And you want to so you observe these values and you want to integrate it with respect to dw. Yeah. Uh, what? Ah. No, no, t is between t1 and t2. Yeah. So this is somewhere here, and you want to compute uh, uh, this uh, delta t times uh, uh, delta w, right? So uh, 
until this T1, the delta value is constant and is equal to delta 0. So it will be delta 0 times W T1 minus W0, which is equal to delta 0 times W T1, right? And then there is a term which is coming from the next delta T1, which is equal to delta T1 times W T minus W T1, right? Because uh, you want to integrate this part. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, so, uh, some of the properties of this integral are uh, uh, the expectation of i square t is equal to expectation of uh, 0 to t delta square u du. Uh, now, uh, either, uh, yeah, so I could give a rough sketch of the proof. Uh, it's quite straightforward actually. So uh, if it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, right, uh, this is the IT process and what we want to find is the expectation of IT square, right? So the first thing that we know is that uh, IT is a random variable, right, because it's a, sum of all these uh, W process, which in itself is random. So IT is a random uh, uh, variable. Uh, and that's why you say you, it makes sense to look at the expectation. And so it's uh, expectation of square of this would be equal to the square of this one, right? Uh, so which will be a summation of delta T square terms times uh, uh, so let me call this thing as dj, right? So dj square plus some cross terms, which would be summation delta t times dj i, di, and dj, right? So where uh, dj is uh, this, this thing, right? So uh, what would be the expectation of this part? So this is di and dj. So what is the expectation of, uh, yeah, so the increments are independent. So it's not uh, just because of that, but also because the uh, expectation of the increment is equal to zero. So that's why it is equal to zero, right? So this term will go off. And then what you are left with is this terms, right? And uh, uh, this one will come out here delta t uh, square and you will have summation of dj square, right? And this we know was uh, the quadratic variation, right? And it's equal to delta t, right? And when the limiting case of delta t goes to, the largest interval size goes to zero, this becomes then integral of delta square t dt, right? This summation will become So this is uh, uh, the expectation of uh, this one is equal to this thing. And the quadratic variation of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Ito's integral is also equal to this, uh, this process i is also equal to delta square u du, right? Uh, so, uh, the, okay, the one difference is here there is an expectation, right? Because this delta can also be a, uh, random process, but in this case, it will be equal to delta square u du. Okay, so uh, so if f was, uh, no, if uh, w was like a, a normal function which could be differentiated, then when you had to do df of wt, you would have f dash wt times w dash t dt, right? Uh, and that would be equal to this thing. But uh, in the case of, uh, uh, because uh, of the non-zero quadratic variation of W, uh, you cannot write, uh, so you will have an additional term there, 
and uh, that term will be equal to this f double dash wt d dwt dwt which is replaced by dt right so let me write this part for you so uh, typically if you have a function of x and y right and you write dfx of y so you will have the partial derivative of this times this dx plus by dy, right? Uh, if uh, instead you have here something like comma wt, what would happen is you just, you will have an additional term, uh, 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 you know, here, which would be dx plus dw dw and this dw dw we know in expectation is equal to dt so we write this as dt right so this is a very crude form of uh, uh, you know uh, you know explaining this thing but uh, this is what you have to sort of get from here that uh, uh, unlike a normal uh, you know standard calculus here if you have a brownian motion involved uh, you would have an additional term which would correspond to the dw dwt term right and that is replaced by dt right so you can think of it as a taylor expansion and in taylor expansion you would have the first order term then the second order term and so on uh, so in normal cases the second order term sort of goes to zero but in this case the second order term doesn't go to zero and it's equal to dt and what you can also see is that the higher order term, so dwt, dwt times dwt or dt times dwt terms also in expectation go to zero. So that's why you are just left with uh, this bit of the expression, right? So, uh, so basically this is what is known as the Ito Dublin formula and using that you can say uh, integrate a function of f uh, which is a, a function of the Brownian motion and it's uh, given by uh, something like this, right? So you will have an FT term, right, with times ZT. Uh, the FX is with respect to this part of the thing. So you will have derivative with respect to whatever was the stochastic times DWT plus half whatever corresponds to this thing. So second derivative with this whatever is the second variable times dt, right? So uh, I, I think what will help here is, uh, okay, so there's also proof of this if you want to go, but uh, let's start with an example where we can use, uh, use this Ito Dublin formula. Uh, so this is also going to come uh, up later in uh, the derivation of black shows equation. I actually not required as such, but uh, would be required in the one of the exercises that we'll do. So uh, let's say that the stock price follows a process which is equal to, which is defined as this. So the ch uh, change in the stock price is equal to, is proportionate to the stock price and it grows at a constant rate mu, right? Uh, uh, so mu st dt and it also has a stochastic component or a noise component uh, which is proportional again to the stock price. So the higher the stock price, the more the noise it would have. Uh, and a 
parameter sigma, which gives overall volatility of the stock. So if there are two stocks, uh, one is less volatile, this will, will have a lower value, and the one which is more uh, uncertain will have a higher value of sigma, and DWT term, right? So if I want to uh, solve this, right, the differential equation, uh, what would I do? Uh, you will have something like uh, dst by st is equal to mu dt plus sigma dwt, right? And uh, uh, this one you will write as log sc, right? dln st is equal to mu dt plus sigma dwt and you can integrate it and you get ln st minus ln s0 is equal to mu t plus sigma wt. Right? Uh, so this, this is what you would do if you were following the normal calculus, right? But this expression is not correct. Right, the reason, uh, where did we make the mistake here? Yeah, so this DLNST is where we have made the mistake. Uh, so what we do then is, we le uh, let's look at what DLNST should be, right? So let's correct our mistake here. Right, so using this uh, uh, Ito's uh, lemma, can you tell me what DLNST would be? Right, so we know that DF of X, right, where X is stochastic uh, or is a function of Brownian motion, would be equal to F dash X DX plus F double dash X dt and half here, right? So in this case, what would it be? It would be equal to 1 over st dst, right? Plus half of uh, minus half what is it going to be? 1 over st uh, square and DST, DST term. And the half from here. Right, so the additional term that you see from uh, unlike normal calculus is this term, right, which is not seen in the uh, normal usual cases, right? So when you want to solve it, then is uh, DLNST will be equal to this thing, which DST we know is equal to mu ST DT plus sigma DWT. And DSC, DSC term would be equal to minus 1 by 2 SC square. So of all this, in this, uh, in this case, the dt dt term should be equal to uh, 0, right? Uh, this term will be equal to, yeah, sigma square s square dt. And dt dwt again is equal to 0, right? So I haven't shown it to you, but uh, this term also goes to 0. So what you then end up with is, uh, it is equal to 1 over st uh, 
Uh, so this ST will cancel. So mu dt plus sigma dW t minus half. The only term that is there here is uh, sigma squared dt, right? So we have mu minus sigma squared by 2 dt plus Right. So the the solution for this, then, if you integrate it, you would what you get is uh, integral of these, and you can get this as uh, ln s t minus ln s zero is equal to mu minus sigma squared to t minus zero, so t plus sigma. Wt, right, and you can write st as s not e raised to power right, so this is uh, this is what is known as the geometric brownian motion Right, and this is a, a assumption in the Black Scholes model that we are going to uh, take up uh, later on, where the stock price uh, follows a, a log normal distribution. Why is it log normal? Because W T is normally distributed, and this is x to the power e. So, if you take the log of the stock price, it will be normally distributed, right? Uh, and uh, the thing that is uh, extra here is this uh, sigma squared by two. And this comes from this uh, Ito Dublin formula, right? So this this was uh, one of the use cases of uh, this Ito's calculus, where you see that you cannot simply differentiate a function which has a stochastic parameter in it, like a no, uh, using normal calculus, right? So uh, this was not uh, equal to this thing. So you cannot write dst by st as d l n s t. Uh, but instead, uh, the value of DLNSC was derived as we went here, right? And uh, so, so uh, yeah, that's the whole point of this uh, Ito's, uh, 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 you know, Ito Dublin formula. So we are going to use it more and more in some of our derivations now. Right? So uh, I, I skipped the uh, proof for. Uh, how this was derived, but basically it's done through Taylor's expansion. So some of the properties of uh, uh, Ito's integral is uh, uh, it's uh, adaptive, so it is uh, uh, you know F, it would be ft measurable. So I, I, some of these things I think I might not uh, uh, you know want to spend too much time on because it might require uh, some prior knowledge, uh, which some of you might have already read through, but um, maybe it wouldn't make sense for everyone. But uh, some of the things that we have already considered and looked at is uh, it's a martingale. So uh, given the value of uh, uh, the expected value of uh, i at a future point of time, given the information at some prior time would be equal to is, right? So that is uh, the martingale property. And uh, Ito's iso Ito, uh, isosymmetry is uh, expectation of square of the integral process uh, is uh, equal to delta square u du. And uh, the quadratic variation is uh, uh, also very similar to this, except now it is uh, uh, there is no expectation, right? Uh, this quadratic variation in itself is a random process, right? So uh, this this is just the expectation of the quadratic variation. Yeah. So uh, the f the last part of the uh, uh, lecture is uh, the derivation of the Black-Scholes equation. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can take a break now. Yeah.